Blake O'Connor was the 2019 Toyota Starmaker winner and that year released his first album, Everything I Feel. He has now released his second album, Finding Light, which is as uplifting as the title suggests. Hi, Blake. G'day. How are you doing, Sophie? I'm very well, thank you, because I've been listening to your album and it just it puts a smile on my face every time I listen to it because I find that the album is, as a whole, a really joyful listening experience. And it sounds like, despite the challenges for musicians from 2020, you're in a good place. Definitely, definitely am. It's, uh, you know, the last few years hasn't been the greatest for musos, but, um, you know, like I'm, I'm on tour at the moment. I've just released an album. Like I'm, I'm back on track and I'm stoked about it. Yeah, so when you set out to record that album was you know because it, it comes through on your voice it's just even though some of the songs are not joyous songs um but there's this real sense of you getting into the studio and enjoying what you're doing definitely I love it and anytime I can be playing music and you know being in some of the studios I worked in to, to make this album you know it's it's a bit you know pinch yourself when you're there so uh <laughs> you know it's I was I was there at a Nick Dedea's studio up in Byron Bay and and Nick's work with work with everybody from you know Springsteen to Snoop Dogg so uh, you know it was it was pretty cool to to you know to be working with him in, in his studio so um you know there was definitely a lot of joy happening when we made the record fantastic now what was the first song written for the album that's a great question um I reckon it would have been chained to the ground actually mm -hmm. I haven't actually thought about that but yeah it would have been chained to the ground which which is one of the songs that's not as joyous as the others. I keep using the word joyous, but it just for me, that's what the album is. Um, Chain to the Ground is a is a really thoughtful song, and um, and it does sound like you're singing to someone else. It's not a song about you. Yes, no, definitely am, definitely am. And uh, this one this one came to me. Um, I was I was asleep, and I just woke up in the middle of the night. And you know how you hear people tell stories about this, and like I've heard it before, and I'm like, oh, it's not true. You know, they've spent hours on the song. But I actually woke up and I grabbed my phone and um, I just had this song stuck in my head and I wrote down about seven verses in 20 minutes or something like that. Wow. And I put my phone down and just forgot about it. And I think I um, went back to sleep. But the day later, it might have been a few days later, I can't quite remember. And uh, yeah, I picked it back up and I'll, I'll look through the words. It's like, oh, it's pretty decent. And I couldn't remember how the, the melody was when I wrote the songs. It was, it was just a bunch of, bunch of words. And uh, I kind of figured something out and wrote a chorus and a bridge for it. And that was pretty much the song done. Right. Yeah, it was one that kind of just chose me, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, so, which also begs the question, who are you singing it to? Because there's definitely an other there, but I, I guess it's for any listener who thinks it's for them. Yes. Maybe. Yeah, no, pretty much, pretty much. We kind of leave that one a little bit unknown. Yeah. And uh, it's always nice for the listener to, you know, come up with their own experience. So when you do things like put notes in your phone in the middle of the night or at other times, and maybe you record a voice memo as well, do you ever go back through things and think, I have absolutely no memory of doing that? <laughs> Definitely. I was actually going through a bunch of old stuff the other day and I was like, you hear stuff and you're like, what the hell were you thinking? Or you go, oh, that's great. You know what I mean? So it's a, yeah. it always changes from time to time. And other times I'm I'm trying to sing, like I'll wake up at night or whatever I'm going to, or I wake up really early and um, I'll sing something into the voice memos. And um, it, like, I don't know what the hell I'm singing. I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't even go to a tune because you know, when your voice is croaky in the morning, you know, it's so many in my phone that just don't even make any sense. <laughs> Well, who knows? They could all turn out to be great songs. Just got to find the missing pieces yeah, to put it all it. together. Now, several of the songs that are on the album were written with Sinead Burgess, who also provides backing vocals from what I can tell. Sinead is a great collaborator with other artists too. I love a song um, she wrote with Jade Holland recently, um, Own My Heart. What, what do you like about writing with her? Oh, she, her musical genius. She's just a musical genius. Her, her mind and the way, you know, the way she approaches songwriting and 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 even producing a song, she co-produced half the album as well. So right. um, just the way you know her brain is on it is yeah, it's it's not something I think of. Like I think of it from a very you know from from my perspective, I'm 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 playing a, like I'm playing live with the band. I want I want to hear it. You know how I can do it live, and I I I, I don't probably think as broad as she does with other aspects and she comes up from a different perspective from where I th I think of things so it's um yeah it's kind of it's, it's it's good to get another person's perspective and everything she adds to it is always always builds it into a way that I end up loving it so yeah it's great she's been living in Nashville for a while I know um because I don't think she's as well known here as she could be uh, possibly because she's been living overseas but I saw her play live at country to country 
which only oh, happened yeah. once before lockdown. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking, oh, she's so good. Like, it would be great to have her performing here more. But then, you know, the world shut down. Yeah, it didn't, didn't adjust. No, she's killer. She's so good. Yeah. <laughs> now, a couple of the songs on the album were written while you were a member of Sam Hawksley's Song Club. Well, I'm guessing it was Sam Hawksley's Song it Club. It was Sam Hawksley's Song Club. Yeah, yeah. Um, that Song Club has resulted in quite a few songs and out al- Felicity Oak and Josh Cunningham's album. Um, yep. Obviously, you got a lot out of it too. I definitely. I think there might be, I'll have to check it, but it might be three, maybe four songs from it. Right. So it's a substantial amount of songs. Like we um we started working on it back in like the album in 2020, and um we went to go back in the studio like a month later, but obviously that everything had shut down, so we couldn't get in there. And then I joined Sam's Song Club, and um the album that I thought it was going to be totally wasn't what it was because you know I wrote a bunch of songs for um you know for for Song Club that actually ended up on the record. Uh, from what I can understand, Song Club was by invitation only. It wasn't like you could just email Sam and go, hey, I've heard about this thing. Can I have in? Yeah, no, Sam sent me a message and I was like, you know what? I probably should. Like, and like, because I wasn't writing songs at that time. I was just, right. you know, thinking about what the hell's going on with the world. And yeah. Playing guitar solos. <laughs> so it was probably nice to, yeah, to zing back into songwriting again. It was great. Uh, obviously that discipline worked for you as well like for some people having that regular schedule of a song a week and and a prompt wouldn't work but um, are you someone who who likes to sort of get an idea or like you might hear a word or there might be a little concept or an object you've seen and that tends to spark you yeah definitely I'm I tend to when I write songs I tend to look around me a lot like um I'll, I'll be looking around the room and I might see you know the light shining through a window or a crushed can on the floor and I'm thinking about, you know, how did, you know, something like that happen or, or what's what's the light reflecting on? Like, I, I'm a very visual person when it comes to writing. Mm. and um, But a lot of things can come from guitar riffs too. Or like, I don't really have a set way. And um, as far as discipline goes, I could have been a heck of a lot more disciplined with um, with, with Sam's Song Club. Because I know, um, I think it was Let A Bit Of Light. I'd totally forgotten about Song Club that week. <laughs> and um, it was about an hour before the song was due. Otherwise, I was going to get kicked out. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, so they have they let you have one pass, and um, if you use the pass up, then you you kicked out if you know if you don't hand it in again. So I had about an hour, and I wrote let a bit of light, and um, yeah, it turned out it turned out good to be under a bit of time pressure. Um, that's the I've interviewed a few people who are a member of that song club. I have not heard about the kicking out parts. <laughs> I just yeah, was, well, yeah, you get you get all you get the the kick. <laughs> I just thought it was this nice, supportive environment, but it sounds like no, there were rules and they were quite harsh. Yeah, he has discipline, so you know, we it makes it makes us all do it. Otherwise, you know, people will be like, oh, I'm not, can't be bothered this week. So it's yeah. actually pretty good that you get kicked out. Yeah. Right. Now you released "Willin' and Ready" as a single. This was a, a little while ago now, and it's a song you wrote with Adam Eckersley and Brooke McClymont. I remember seeing the McClymont show at the Tamworth Country Music Festival. It was the year you won Star Maker because they introduced you as the Star Maker winner, uh, yes. and you were the support act. Yeah. Um, so that McClymont Association is now a long one, obviously. Big time. And like prior to then, I was touring with Adam and Brooke since I think 2016. Okay. So um, yeah, I, I went to a, a mate's birthday party that he asked me to jump up and sing a few songs on, and uh, it turned out to be a bit of like a mini festival. And and Adam and Brooke were there, and I met him mm-hmm. from there, and yeah, just toured toured with the two of them for years. And then once I won Star Maker, I jumped on with the McClamets and toured with them for the tw- for the twelve months. And uh, yeah, it was they're, they're killer killer like musos and, and just great people. Yeah, well, no wonder Brooke sounded like a very proud big sister when she <laughs> introduced you at that show. She'd known you for a while. Yeah, no, she's a champ. She's a champ. No, all the girls are. Yeah. Now, your sound is a combination of influences, including soul, um, and there is a song called Soul Feeling on it. Yeah. What music did you love when you were growing up? Um, well, I kind of listened to just about everything, and I didn't really know genres. Like, I didn't think about what genre a song was. My mum and dad had the radio on all the time, and that was – I remember – the first couple of songs I remember hearing were like when Guy Sebastian won Idol and right. he's got Angels Bought Me Here and there's a little video of me singing my heart out when I'm like three years old in the lounge room and I sound dreadful but like it was it was the Guy Sebastian song and from there like I found you know mum and dad always played you know Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton and my, my granddad loved Burl Ives and Johnny Cash so I listened to a lot of country but the soul thing I think started with like the Guy Sebastian stuff and right. even from there, I remember hearing Bill Withers and absolutely loving it, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know what kind of genre that was. 
but um yeah there's that kind of vocal where there a lot of runs and a lot of just the support there I guess I yeah know that is but yeah it's support I guess <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what do you like to listen to now uh, I listen to just about everything still so um I had Bruno Mars on the other day and listened to you know Hal and Wolf he's an old old blues singer and mm. a lot of uh a lot of I guess I guess blues soul and a lot of the lot a lot of the country I listen to is still that old school stuff. So if I put a record on, it's you know the Shotgun Willie album, or it's the yeah. um, you know, Stardust by Willie Nelson, like a lot of the Willie Nelson and like Kenny Rogers sort of stuff, or even Anne Murray. I know she she's like one of my favorite songwriters ever. Yeah. So um yeah, if I listen to any country, it's always the 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 kind of old school stuff. Yeah, I I'd completely forgotten about Anne Murray, but now that you've mentioned, I'm like oh, I think I will go and listen to some Anne Murray. Um, <laughs> She often doesn't get mentioned, but um, yeah, she was a hugely influential artist. And so you listening to Guy when you were a little person and you have, have various influences uh, musically, because I'm trying to work out where this voice came from, because you have this beautiful singing voice and that's not always the case um, <laughs> with artists. You know, sometimes they're great songwriters, sometimes great performers, both. But singing for you, I mean, you play other instruments as well. You play harmonica, guitar um but when did you start singing and when and what do you think shaped the voice you have in terms of influences um I actually started playing guitar a lot longer before I started like well and truly before I started singing so I think I picked up the guitar when I was about five or six and um just tinkered around, around with it and I think I was about 11 and I thought I decided to like decide to try and start singing because that's what guitar players did and it wasn't like a, oh, I'm a good singer, so I'm going to sing more. It was just, I just tried it because, yeah, everyone who sings normally plays a guitar. Right. And, uh, you know, Ed Sheeran was really big when I was about 11. So that's when he bought out the Plus album. Mm -hmm. He was a singer-songwriter. And I was like, well, I play guitar. You know, I can, you know, I can try and sing and, and write songs. So I, um, yeah, I really dug into, I guess, being more of an artist and, and understanding that side of things. And and I did, like, I listened to a ton of, ton of Ed Sheeran and, Mm -hmm. And, you know, from there I heard like the Zach Brown band and that was a big turning point for me when I, when I heard the Zach Brown band, cause I'm like, it was all that, the, the musicality in the band. And I just watched them the other day at CMC rocks and they mm -hmm. killed it. So it was um, a kind of a big turning point going from just a singer songwriter to understanding bands and, and um, you know, just the support and musicality of things. Mm. But did you take any singing lessons? Oh yeah. I had a couple of singing lessons. There was a, a local teacher um, and I was with him for maybe a year, I think. And it was um it was a lot more about performing and and um and, and you know building repertoire and, and building songs and, and and building your songbook essentially which come in handy because uh, I ended up playing a um a gig like jumping up in the break for uh, one of my friends friends sets they played down the road and uh, the venue were like oh do you want to come and, and sing a, a few more songs you know next week I've got a three hour set and I was like I only know seven songs. So uh, I, had to, I had to go go back to that songbook and relearn a, a ton of songs. <laughs> I, I mean, because you said you had a couple of lessons, so, but I think it proves that this voice of yours is just is just some kind of instrument that comes from somewhere. I, I imagine once you started singing, your parents were like, oh, we've got a live one here. Yeah, yeah, they were really supportive. They were really supportive. And, and I, you know, I sang all the time. Like once I started, there was, there was no stopping me. And, um, you know, I sang at school. I bought my guitar to school every day, played it and sang in lunch and recess. And the okay. teachers were really supportive as well. I remember one music teacher, uh, Mr. Rigg, he's, uh, he still comes to my gigs and, and I, you know, he was there when I won the golden guitar at Tamworth and, and Starmaker. So he just, he doesn't tell you he's coming. He just pops up. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, he really pushed me to perform and, and get in front of the school and, and classrooms. And he would pull me out of, out of class to go and perform in other, other classrooms and stuff for, for his students. So, um, you know, a lot, lot to thank for him and, and just my parents for being supportive and just going, you, you know, you go all right and really, you know, hold me together to, to get out there and perform. Yeah. Given um, the way your voice sounds, the tone in it um, and the things you could do with it, I imagine that country wasn't necessarily your only option. You could have gone the crooner route, for example. Yeah, honestly, I never really thought about, you know, what what I suited, essentially. Mm -hmm. I Yeah, I just sang what I liked. And um, yeah, I guess singing country with a bit of a soulful voice, there's not too many, you know, people that, that do it. And, and I, I love it. Like, it's good fun. So I don't, I don't really, yeah, I don't try and think too much about what, what genres are. I never really have. I just kind of sing what I like. Yeah. Now you mentioned you saw Zach Brown band at CMC. You also performed there. So how was that? Oh, that was great. It was awesome. 
and you know it's been i've been wanting to play that festival for so long and uh when i when i got the gig and i found out i was going to be on main stage i was like i've got to get the good band so i um i pulled together a 10 piece band for the show and uh had you know horns and bvs and the whole shebang so it was honestly my dream gig and it turned out like exactly what i hoped a 10 piece band so what was rehearsal like uh it was actually tough so i'd only played with the bass player and the drummer before mm-hmm. so um they were you know they're, they're my regular band that we play all the time and uh we couldn't actually get everybody in the same room to rehearse so it was the week of and i managed to book in half the band so i had um two backing vocals horns and the guest singer and the Hammond so so six people in the band I got them in one room which was great and I met all of them that day and that was the Wednesday before the gig and I managed to get the bass player drums and other guitar player into another studio to rehearse (laughs) the day before the gig and everybody met each other the morning of the show so yeah it's logistics is hard when you're trying to you know get 10 people in the same room well, particularly when it's a festival like that, when it's not in a in a city where there's an airport right next to you, like you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and like half the players are were from Sydney too, or, or Byron Bay, or scattered around. You know, one was in Caloundra, and like they were, it was all quite scattered. So it was it was tough to kind of get everyone going for it. But as soon as you know, everyone knew we were playing CMC, and everyone wanted to play CMC, so um, <laughs> it was yeah, it, it wasn't too hard to try and find people to play the gig. It was just getting him getting him on the day off to rehearse. Yeah, yeah. Now, as I speak to you, you're in Queensland and you have some shows in Queensland. By the time people see this interview, those shows may be passed. Um, so I'm wondering, do you have some other dates planned in Australia or are you looking further afield as in Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, definitely. So we've, um, I think we've finished this run on April 8th and I play the last show just outside of Port Macquarie in a town mm-hmm. called Telegraph Point. And uh, we actually filmed a video clip there a few weeks ago. So it's kind of like at, at this venue. So I was like, it's kind of cool. I, I want to do a little show here. And so that's, yeah, April 8th. And then from there, we fly to Nashville for a little bit. We're heading over there for a few months uh, th- this year, which is going to be great. So it's nice to spend some time over there. And then coming back here in end of September, October to um, to play another tour. So, yeah. Have a so when you days. go to Nashville for a trip, do you line up songwriting sessions or do you just tend to get there and think, oh, I'll see what happens? Oh, I normally, like, to be honest, I tend to just go over there and see what happens. I've, you know, mm-hmm. I've got a couple lined up or I might have one or two, but most of the time it's, it's, it's good to keep a bit of a spotty schedule. So, you know, if a lot, a lot of the time over there, it's like, Hey, what are you doing next week? Do you want to come over for a ride? Or do you want to come and play, play this gig with me? Like I remember last time, well, the first time I went there, I was 19 and I played a festival in the UK just before we went there. And um, the guy that ended up playing the festival with me was uh, uh, Lee Bryce's younger brother, uh, Lewis Bryce. Mm. And um, he watched a bit of the show and come up to me. He was like, ma'am, are you, you know, you got to get to Nashville. I'm like, I'm actually coming from here to Nashville. And he's like, cool, I've got a gig. Do you want to come and play with, with me? And it turned out that, you know, all the writers were there, like the people who wrote for Luke Holmes and Stapleton and like anybody who was a writer was at this gig. Even um, Earl Bud Lee, who wrote for uh, uh, Garth Brooks, was hanging out there and, and Charles Eston. So it just kind oh, of, yeah. you know, you just thrown into this and I was like 18 or 19 going oh Jesus what am I doing here <laughs> but you know a lot of people just see and like just come over and, and play some songs so um it's it's I tend to keep my calendar a little bit clear and just see what happens yeah because it sounds like it would be a magical mystery tour definitely yeah. definitely <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, such a magical place yeah well um we'll miss you in Australia for the time you're away um but it sounds like we can look forward to some shows later in the year in the meantime people can listen to Finding Light as I said up top such a great album and um and I have had it on repeat I will keep having it on repeat and Blake O'Connor it's been great to talk to you oh likewise Sophie thanks for having a chat